Hey there everyone, welcome to the last episode of my series on Animal Farm. Today we will be reading the concluding chapter of the novel, and then we'll have a discussion, and I'll be reading a lot of the Wikipedia on the novel, um, just so if you don't know about the book, you can learn a bit about it, and if um, and to make the episode a little bit longer, um, and if you're interested, feel free to stick around um, when the story finishes. Okay, this is chapter ten of Animal Farm, written by George Orwell. Chapter 10 Years passed. The seasons came and went. The short animal lives flew by. A time came when there was no one who remembered the old days before the rebellion, except Clover, Benjamin, Moses the Raven, and a number of the pigs. Muriel was dead. Blue Ball, Jesse, and Pincher were dead. Jones, too, was dead. He had died of Inebrite's home in another part of the country. Snowball was forgotten. Boxer was forgotten, except by the few who had known him. Clover was an old stout mare, stiff in the joints and with a tendency to roomy eyes. She was two years past the retiring age, but in fact no animal had actually retired. The talk of setting aside a corner of the pasture for superannuated animals had long since been dropped. Napoleon was now a mature boar of 24 stone. Squealer was so fat that he could, with difficulty, see out of his eyes. Only old Benjamin was much the same as ever except for being a little greyer about the muzzle, and since Boxer's death, more morose and taciturn than ever. There were many more creatures on the farm now, though the increase was not so great that had been expected in earlier years. Many animals had been born to whom the rebellion was only a dim tradition passed on by the word of mouth, and others had been brought up, had never heard mentioned such a thing before their arrival. The farm possessed three horses now besides Clover. They were fine upstanding beasts, willing workers, and good comrades, but very stupid. None of them proved able to learn the alphabet beyond the letter B. They accepted everything that they were told about the rebellion and the principles of animalism, especially from Clover, from whom they had almost filial respect. But it was doubtful whether they understood very much of it. The farm was more prosperous now, and better organised. It had been enlarged by two fields which had been bought from Mr Pilkington. The windmill had been successfully completed at last, and the farm possessed a threshing machine and a hay elevator of its own and various new buildings had been added to it. Wimper had bought himself a dodge cart. The windmill, however, had not after all been used for generating electrical power. It was used for milling corn, and brought in a handsome money profit. The animals were hard at work, building yet another windmill. When that one was finished, so it was said, the dynamos would be installed but the luxuries of which Snowball had once taught the animals to dream. The stalls with electric light and hot and cold water and the three-day week were no longer talked about. Napoleon had denounced such ideas as contrary to the spirit of animalism. The truest happiness, he said, lay in working hard and living frugally. Somehow it seemed as though the farm had grown richer without making the animals themselves any richer. Except, of course, for the pigs and the dogs. Perhaps this was partly because there were so many pigs and as many dogs. 
It was not that these creatures did not work after this fashion. There was, as Squealer was never tired of explaining, endless work in the supervision and organisation of the farm. Much of this work was a kind that the other animals were too ignorant to understand. For example, Squealer told them that the pigs had to be had to expend enormous labours every day upon mysterious things called files, reports, minutes, memoranda. These were large sheets of paper which had to be closely covered with writing, and as soon as they were so covered that they were burnt in the furnace. This was of the highest importance for the welfare of the farm, Squealer said. But still, neither pigs nor dogs produced any food by their own labour. And there were very many of them, and their appetites were always good. And as for the others, their life, so far as they knew, was as it had always been. They were generally hungry, they slept on straw, they drank from the pool, they laboured in the fields. In winter, they were troubled by the cold, and in summer by the flies. Sometimes the older ones among them racked in their dim memories and tried to remember in the early days of the rebellion when Joan's expulsion was still recent, things had been better or worse than now. They could not remember. There was nothing with which they could compare their lives. They had nothing to go upon except Squealer's list of figures, which invariably demonstrated that everything was getting better and better. The animals found the problem insoluble. In any case, they had little time for speculating on such things now. Only old Benjamin professed to remember every detail of his long life and to know that things had never been, nor ever could be, much better or much worse. Hunger, hardship, and disappointment being, so he said, the unalterable law of life. And yet the animals never gave up hope. More, they never lost, even for an instant, their sense of honour and privilege in being members of Animal Farm. They were still the only farm in the whole country in all England, owned and operated by animals. Not one of them, not even the youngest, not even the newcomers who had been brought from farms ten or twenty miles away, ever ceased to marvel at that. And when they heard the gun booming and saw the green flag fluttering at the masthead, their hearts swelled with imperishable pride. And the talk turned always towards the heroic days, the expulsion of Jones, the writing of the Seven Commandments, the great battles in which the human invaders had been defeated. None of the old dreams had been abandoned. The Republic of the Animals, which Major had foretold, when the green fields of England should be untrodden by human feet, was still believed in. Some day it was coming. It might not be soon. It might not be within the lifetime of any animal now living. But still it was coming. Even the tune of Beasts of England was perhaps hummed secretly here and there. At any rate, it was a fact that every animal on the farm knew it, though no one would have dared to sing it aloud. It might be that their lives were hard, and that not all of their hopes had been fulfilled. But they were conscious that they were not as other animals. If they went hungry, it was not from feeding tyrannical human beings. If they worked hard, at least they worked for themselves. No creature called any other creature master. All animals were equal. One day, in early summer, Squealer ordered his sheep to follow him and let them out to a piece of waste ground on the other end of the farm, which had become overgrown with birch saplings. The sheep spent the whole day there, browsing at the leaves under Squealer's supervision. In the evening, he returned to the farmhouse himself, but it was, it was warm weather, told the sheep to stay there, where they were. It ended by their remaining there for a whole week, during which time the other animals saw nothing of them. Squealer was with them for the greater part of every day. He was, he said, teaching them to sing a new song for which privacy was needed. It was just after the sheep had returned on a pleasant evening when the animals had finished work and were making their way back to the farm buildings. 
that the terrified neighing of a horse sounded from the yards. Startled, the animals stopped in their tracks. It was Clover's voice. She neighed again, and the animals broke into a gallop and rushed into the yard. Then they saw what Clover had seen. It was a pig walking on his hind legs. Yes, it was Squealer, a little awkwardly as though not quite used to supporting his considerable bulk in that position, but with perfect balance. He was strolling across the yard, and a moment later, out from the door of the farmhouse, came a long file of pigs, all walking on their hind legs. Some did it better than others. One or two were even a trifle unsteady and looked as though they would have liked the support of a stick. But every one of them made his way right round the yard successfully. And finally, there was a tremendous baying of dogs and a shrill crowing from the black cockerel, and out came Napoleon himself, majestically upright, casting haughty glances from side to side, and with his dogs gambolling round him. He carried a whip in his trotter. There was a deadly silence. Amazed, terrified, huddling together, the animals watched the long line of pigs march slowly round the yard. It was as though the world had turned upside down. Then there came a moment when the first shock had worn off, when in spite of everything, in spite of the terror of the dogs and of the habit, developed through long years of never complaining, never criticising, no matter what happened, they might have uttered some word of protest, but just as that moment, as though a signal, all the sheep burst out in a tremendous bleating of four legs good, two legs better, four legs good, two legs better, four legs good, two legs better. It went on for five minutes without stopping, and by the time the sheep had quieted down, the chance to utter any protest had passed, and for the pigs had marched back into the farmhouse. Benjamin felt a nose nuzzling at his shoulder. He looked round. It was Clover. Her old eyes looked dimmer than ever. Without saying anything, she tugged gently at his mane and led him round to the edge of the barn, the seven commandments were written for a minute or two they stood gazing at the tarred wall with its white lettering my sight is failing she said finally even when i was young i could not read the what was written there but it appears to me that the wall looks different are the seven commandments the same as they used to be benjamin for once benjamin consented to break his rule and he read out what was written on the wall there was nothing except a single commandment. It ran. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. After that, it did not seem strange when the next day the pigs who were supervising the work of the farm all carried whips in their trotters. It did not seem strange to learn that the pigs had bought themselves a wireless set, were arranging to install a telephone, had had taken out a subscription to John Bull, Tidbits, and the Daily Mirror. It did not seem strange when Napoleon was seen strolling in the farmhouse garden with a pipe in his mouth. No, not even when the pigs took Mr. Jones's clothes out of the wardrobes and put them on. Napoleon himself appearing in a black coat, a rat catcher breeches, and leather leggings, while his favourite so appeared in the watering silk dress which Mrs. Jones had been used to wear on Sundays. A week later in the afternoon, a number of dog carts drove up to the farm. A deputation of neighbouring farmers had been invited to make a tour of inspection. They were shown all over the farm and expressed great admiration for everything they saw, especially the windmill. The animals were weeding the turnip field. They worked diligently, hardly, raising their faces from the ground and not knowing whether to be more frightened of the pigs or of the human visitors. That evening, loud laughter and bursts of singing came from the farmhouse, and suddenly, at the sound of mingled voices, the animals were stricken with curiosity. 
What could be happening in there now that for the first time the animals and human beings were mating on terms of equality? With one accord, they began to creep as quietly as possible into the farmhouse garden. At the gate, they paused. Half frightened to go on, but Clover led the way. They tiptoed up to the house, and such animals as were tall enough peered in at the dining room window. There, round the long table, sat half a dozen farmers and half a dozen of the more eminent pigs, Napoleon himself occupying the seat of honour at the head of the table. The pigs appeared completely at ease in their chairs. The company had been enjoying a game of cards, but had broken off for the moment, evidently in order to drink a toast. A large jug was circulating, and the mugs were being refilled with beer. No one noticed the wandering faces of the animals gazing at the window. Mr. Pilkington, of Foxwood, had stood up, his mug in his hand. In a moment, he said, he would ask the present company to drink a toast. But before doing that, there are a few words that he felt it incumbent upon the him to say. It was a source of great satisfaction to him, he said, and he was sure to all others present to feel that a long period of mistrust and misunderstanding had now come to an end. There had been a time, not that he or any of the present company had shared such sentiments, but there had been a time when the respected proprietors of Animal Farm had been regarded, he would not say with hostility, but perhaps with a certain measure of misgiving by their human neighbours. Unfortunate incidents had occurred, mistaken ideas had been current. It had been felt that the existence of a farm owned and operated by pigs was somehow abnormal and was liable to have an unsettling effect on the neighbourhood. Too many farmers had assumed, without due inquiry, that on a farm a spirit of licence and indiscipline would prevail. They had been nervous about the effects upon their animals or even upon their human employees. But all such doubts were now dispelled. Today he and his friends had visited Animal Farm and inspected every inch of it with their own eyes. And what did they find? Not only the most up-to-date methods, but a discipline and an orderliness which should have been an example to all farmers everywhere. He believed that he was right in saying that the lower animals on Animal Farm did more work and received less food than any animal in the country. Indeed, he and his fellow visitors today had observed many features which they intended to introduce on their own farms immediately. He would end his remarks, he said, by emphasising once again the friendly feelings that subsisted and ought to subsist between Animal Farm and its neighbours. Between pigs, human beings, there was not, and there need not be, any clash of interest whatsoever. Their struggles and their difficulties were one. Was not the labour problem the same everywhere? Here it became apparent that Mr Pilkington was about to spring some carefully prepared witticism on the company, but for a moment he was too overcome by amusement to be able to utter it. After much choking, during which his previous chins turned purple, he managed to get it out. If you have your lower animals to contend with, he said, we have our lower classes. This bon mot set the table in a roar, and Mr Pilkington once again congratulated the pigs on the low rations, the long working hours, and the general absence of pampering, which he had observed on Animal Farm. And now, he said finally, he would ask the company to rise to their feet and make certain that their glasses were full. Gentlemen, concluded Mr. Pilkington, gentlemen, I give you a toast to the prosperity of Animal Farm. There was enthusiastic cheering and stamping of feet. Napoleon was so grateful that he left his place and came round the table to clink his mug against Mr. Pilkington's before emptying it. When the cheering had died down, Napoleon, who had remained on his feet, intimidated that he too had a few words to say. 
like all of Napoleon's speeches, it was short and to the point. He too, he said, was happy that the period of misunderstanding was at an end. For a long time, there had been rumours circulated, he had reason to think, by some malignant enemy, that there was something subversive and even revolutionary in the outlook of himself and his colleagues. They had been credited with attempting to stir up rebellion among the animals on neighbouring farms. Nothing could be further from the truth. Their sole wish, now and in the past, was to live at peace and in normal business relations with their neighbours. This farm, which he had the honour to control, he added, was a cooperative enterprise. The title deeds, which were in his own position, were owned by the pigs jointly. He did not believe, he said, that any of the old suspicions still lingered, but certain changes had been made recently in the routine of the farm which should have the effect of promoting confidence still further. Hitherto, the animals on the farm had had a rather foolish custom of addressing one another as comrade. This too was to be suppressed. There had also been a very strange custom, whose origin was unknown, of marching every Sunday morning past a boar's skull which was nailed to a post in the garden. This too would be suppressed, and the skull had already been buried. His visitors might have observed, too, the green flag which flew from the masthead. If so, they would perhaps have noted that the white hoof and horn with which it had previously been marked had now been removed. It would be a plain green flag from now onwards. He had only one criticism, he said, to make of Mr. Pilkington's excellent and neighbourly speech. Mr. Pilkington had referred throughout to Animal Farm. He could not, of course, for he, Napoleon, was only for the first time announcing it that the name Animal Farm had actually been abolished. Henceforward, the farm was to be known as the Manor Farm, for which he believed was its correct and original name. Gentlemen, concluded Napoleon, I will give you the same toast as before, but in a different form. Fill your glasses to the brim, gentlemen. Here is my toast to the prosperity of the manor farm. There was the same hearty cheering as before, and the mugs were emptied to the dregs. But as the animals outside gazed at this scene, it seemed to them that some strange thing was happening. What was it that altered in the faces of the pigs? Clover's old dim eyes flitted from one face to another. Some of them had five chins, some had four, some had three. But what was it that seemed to be melting and changing? Then the applause, having coming to an end, the company took up their cards and continued the game that had been interrupted, and the animals crept silently away. But they had not gone twenty yards when they stopped short. An uproar of voices was coming from the farmhouse. They rushed back and looked through the window again. Yes, a violent quarrel was in progress. There were shoutings, bangings on the tables, sharp, suspicious glances, furious denials. The source of the trouble appeared to be that Napoleon and Mr. Pilkington had each played an ace of spades simultaneously. Twelve voices were shouting in anger, and they were all alike. No question now what had happened to the faces of the pigs. The creatures outside looked from pig to man, and from man to pig, and from pig to man again, but already it was impossible to say which one was which. Thank you very much for listening. Um, that's the end of Animal Farm. Now, as a short discussion, um, it's quite an interesting book. I mean, there's a lot going on. It's very obviously a metaphor, um, of course, for the Russian Revolution, but also um, human behaviour in general. 
Um, we're very forgetful. As you can see, the animal's forgetting over time. We're easily persuaded by propaganda, rhetoric. Um, and so it's quite... Uh, on one hand, it's very humorous in its satire, but it's it's also quite somber in its tone and its depiction of humans. It's honestly, it's really quite bleak. It doesn't give humans really uh, much of a um, go to kind of prove themselves in a positive. Um, most of the the attributes that the book anthropomorphizes the animals with uh, are negative anthropomorphizations anthropomorphizations um, and so there are some positives but I would say that most of the satire of the book plays off the negative um, but still that's Orwellian writing George Orwell kind of is a little bit of a downer most of the time when you read him but there you go that's the book I hope you really enjoyed it and now um, it's time to read the Wikipedia I'm going to have a short break drink some water and then I'll read but be right back okay I am back I just paused it so for you it was a second um, I'm here and I have the Wikipedia open. All credits, of course, go to Wikipedia. I'm not uh, uh, an author. I've not contributed to this, so none of this is my property, neither as Animal Farm. Animal Farm is public domain. Um, Wikipedia is Commons 3.0, whatever license that is. Um, so anyway. Animal Farm is an allegorical novella by George Orwell, first published in England on the 17th of August, 1945. The book tells the story of a group of farm animals who rebel against their human farmer, hoping to create a society where the animals can be equal, free, and happy. Ultimately, however, the rebellion is betrayed and the farm ends up in a state as bad as it was before under the dictatorship of a pig named Napoleon. According to Orwell, the fable reflects events leading up to the Russian Revolution of 1917 and then on onto, into the Stalinist era of the Soviet Union. Overall, a democratic socialist was a critic of Joseph Stalin and hostile to Moscow-directed Stalinism an attitude that was critically shaped by his experiences during the Spanish Civil War. The Soviet Union, he believed, had become a brutal dictatorship, built upon a cult of personality and enforced by a reign of terror. In a letter to Yvonne Dave, Orwell describes Animal Farm as a satirical tale against Stalin, and in his essay Why I Write, published in 1946, wrote that Animal Farm was the first book in which he tried with full consciousness of what he was doing to fuse political purpose and artistic purpose into one whole. The original title was Animal Farm, a fairy story, but US publishers dropped the subtitle when it was published in 1946, and only one of the translations during Orwell's lifetime kept it. Other titular variations include subtitles like a satire and a contemporary satire. Orwell suggests the title, uh, of which I cannot pronounce, it's a French translation, which abbreviates to U-R-S-A and the Latin word for bear or symbol of Russia. That's quite interesting. It also played on the French name of the Soviet Union. Orwell wrote the book between November 1945 and February 1944, when the UK was in its wartime alliance with the Soviet Union against Nazi Germany, and the British people and intelligentsia held Stalin in high esteem, a phenomenon that Orwell hated, and rightly so if we look back at history and see what Stalin did. The manuscript was initially rejected by a number of British and American publishers, including one of Orwell's own, Victor Gollans, which delayed its publication. 
It became a great commercial success when it did appear partly because international relations were transformed as the wartime alliance gave way to the Cold War. Time magazine chose this book as one of the 100 best English language novels from 1923 to 2005. It was also featured at number 31 on the modern library list of the best 20th century novels. It won a retrospective Hugo Award in 1996 and is included in the Great Books of the Western World selection. That is the basic Wikipedia entry. Now, um, I've quite enjoyed doing this series. Um, uh, I'm always looking for more literature, more books to read. If you have anything, and if you happen to know that it's in the public domain, um, please tell me. You can message me. You can uh, comment. I read every comment. Um, but, yeah, I'm just very grateful that this seems to get positive feedback um, because it's something that I enjoy and I've enjoyed this series very much and I hope you've enjoyed and I hope you've managed to stay and be relaxed and I hope this ramble can help relax you because that Wikipedia article was a bit of a knowledge dump and it's got a lot of complicated stuff to take in at once, so just time to maybe synthesize that in your brain and have a pause and have a break and a rest and thank you for listening. I'm grateful that you've been here and Goodbye.